everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Natalia, if you haven't met me yet. Um, the host of all this, as you can tell by my name being repeated a million times behind us. Um, today we're going to start off with a little sustainability panel because this whole little fashion show is in honor of Earth Month, uh, which if you didn't know, April's Earth Month, next week, Earth Day. Earth Cella is happening, where's Laura and Dad? <laughs> We're not going to Coachella, or Coachella is happening next week too. You know, shout out. Um, I had to plug that one in. But today we're just going to start on a little sustainability panel. I've got some of my lovely friends here, um, which I'll have them introduce themselves here shortly. But just want to talk about sustainability and fashion, which is obviously what myself and all the designers that you're going to see later focus in on. Um, and yeah, I feel like it's just a great topic that we should cover, so we're going to do that. Um, so we'll start off with each of you just giving you like a little introduction, who you are, what you do, whatever you want to say, whatever little background, or maybe how you got into sustainable fashion as well. Just do it all at once. Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Vermeer. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Teleport, which is a new thrifting app that's like TikTok meets Depop. So the cards on your seat, that's for me. Hi everyone. Uh, my claim to fame is I've not had any new clothes in the last 11 plus years. So I had an aha moment over a decade ago about my own consumption habits and really challenged myself to only shop secondhand, vintage, thrifted, so to myself. Uh, so I have a background of fashion and tech and really an obsessed with solving problems in this space. Hi everyone, my name is Bridget and I am the co-founder of Shop Zero with Ellie here. And I do everything having to do with the environmental science and sustainability behind our platform. Um, and I got into sustainable fashion because I was actually living in Africa, focused on sustainable development, and I thought I was going to go more so a science route. And then Ellie and I got connected, she told me what she was doing, and I just kind of fell into working in sustainable fashion that way. Hi everyone, I'm Ellie and I'm the co-founder of Shop Zero. Shop Zero is basically the sustainable version of Revolve, so everything on our website is extensively vetted. And I got into sustainable fashion because my aunt is a stylist, and then I'm also from Boca Raton, Florida, so I grew up implementing sustainability practices in my everyday lifestyle. And then when I realized that fashion was super detrimental to the environment, I wanted to make a change, and then Bridget and I collaborated and we started this company a year ago. And my name is Megan McSherry and I am a sustainable fashion influencer, creator, educator, everything on the internet. Um, activism is my handle. And I got into sustainable fashion kind of by accident. I always wanted to work in fashion or do something in fashion. And the first research paper I had to write in college was sustainability issues in the industry you want to work in. So from there, I was like, oh my god, I can't, <laughs> I can't work in fast fashion. Um, I just completely changed everything that I wanted to do. And here we are. And I'm Natalia, like I said earlier. Um, but I'll give you my little background, too. Um, so I am a designer, and I went to fashion school. I went to FIT in New York. And before that, I don't think I'd ever heard the word sustainability, because I grew up in the Midwest. Um, shout out, Indiana. <laughs> I don't think there's a single person from Indiana out here, but you know, <laughs> shout out. Um, but yeah, so I grew up there, and it's not obviously a topic that's very discussed, or at least it wasn't back when I was in high school. Um, and then I went to school in New York, and a lot of my classmates were like East Coast, West Coast people, and like obviously those coasts do talk about it a little more, so it's just a subject that came up a lot in conversation. So I was like, what are these people talking about? Like, I don't understand what's going on. Um, and I had a specific classmate that would always talk about Zara being like the worst store ever. And that was my favorite store. And I was like, there, I need to look this up. I was like, what am I doing? Um, and then quickly, you know, once you do like the tiniest bit of research, you're like, oh, this is really bad. Um, so that was when I was like, okay, well, if I'm gonna be in this industry, if I'm gonna be a designer, I'm gonna hopefully choose the better route and hopefully try to do something good for the world instead of like, feeding into what everybody else is doing and taking the easy route and maybe making easy money, but um, I feel like I'd rather just do good with my life than not. So that's how I got into it, and now we're still here. So um, yeah, so first question I have for each of you, because I feel like sustainability is a very gray, gray area, and there's no you know set definition. Um, what do you look for as like sustainable fashion? Like what, what do you determine? 
to be sustainable or not? What are your favorite, like your, yeah, factors that you look for? Um, I, I think I have a pretty unique approach to this. Obviously there are sustainable fashion brands, which I think the Shop Zero Girls can definitely touch on because their vetting process is very extensive. Um, and you look for how they treat their employees and their garment workers. Do they pay fair wages? Are they working in sweatshop conditions? Um, you also look at materials. Are they natural materials? Are they synthetic materials? Are they recycled? Are they actually using recycled materials? <laughs> they say that they are. Um, things like that and the amount of items that are produced, but I also think we can look at sustainable fashion not on a brand side, but as a mindset. Um, how often are you buying clothes? Why are you buying them? Uh, are you buying them for one purpose? Are you going to wear them once and then get rid of them? You can buy fast fashion even though I don't ever recommend it, <laughs> but you can buy it with a sustainable approach. If it's something you're going to wear a lot, you're going to learn how to manage, you're going to learn how to take care of. So I think a lot about sustainable fashion and the, the mindset that somebody can have going into a purchase. And that's just thinking about how often you'll wear it, if you know how to care for it, um, and if it's something that you really love. So I'll have Bridget go touch upon our sustainability practices a little bit more in depth. But the way that we at Shop Zero look at sustainability is from a really holistic approach. So we take into consideration everything throughout the supply chain. Um, but to put into perspective how big the issue of greenwashing is, when Bridget and I first started coming up with our requirements, we vetted around 500 sustainable brands, sustainable brands that marketed themselves as sustainable. And we ended up with only 30 of those brands actually meeting our requirements but Bridget can touch upon um, everything we do for our vetting process. Um, so I think my kind of issue with sustainable fashion is anything that's like consumption facing just isn't sustainable. And so what I found when looking for sustainable fashion is it's more so about the conversations we're able to have with different brands. You can really tell kind of someone's understanding and what they're building their company based off of. Because there's not one blanket thing that you can say, oh, well, every brand did this, then fashion would be sustainable. It really differs per process and like what's being made. So I think part of it is just making sure that everyone has a very like, strong understanding of what they're actually doing when they're building a brand that's sustainable. I kind of have a hot take on this. I hate the word sustainability when it comes to fashion because having worked in this space and been with brands in this space for over a decade, it is almost a form of greenwashing. And so for greenwashing, for those who aren't as familiar, it's basically like a psyop where they're trying to trick people into thinking it's better for you, it's better for the environment. But a lot of times the claims have like no backing. And I'm sure it's if you want from 500 down to 30, that's a pretty uh, low conversion rate in a way for what is truly sustainable. So the way that I think about it is all of those factors, technically, supply chain wise, scope one, two, three, there's so many different ways to think of it, but I think it comes down to what is the mindset, to Megan's point, and then also where is it coming from? Does it already exist? Is it something already in your closet? Because at the end of the day, that is the reality. The most sustainable thing is what you already own, or what you can mend, or your work. And then from there, it's how are you being more conscious and factoring in? Is it actually better for the environment, or is it just greenwashing? I totally agree with Danielle that the word sustainable when attached to fashion definitely bothers me because it just doesn't fit. My dad's always like, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> and I used to get so mad at him for saying that, but he's, he's right. And so a term or a phrase that I've started to embrace more lately is slow fashion, and it just, because as we all are saying, there's just no consumption of fashion that is sustainable. There's no production of fashion that can be sustainable. You can do it more sustainably. You can do it more mindfully. You can do it more thoughtfully. Really put a lot of work and effort into how you're making something, why you're making something, how much of it you're making. Um, but the idea of slow fashion also focuses on the consumption from the consumer side as well. Just adding on to that, I think it's funny that I'm saying like sustainable, like you hate that word, because I was literally texting Megan about this event, being like, what can I name this event? Because I was like, if I use the word 
conscious couture. And like, H&M has a conscious collection. I'm like, nobody likes that word anymore. But then I was like, everything just sounded cliche if like I used eco-friendly. I'm like, that just sounds so not eco-friendly. I was having the hardest time. And I was like, what about mindful? <laughs> like, let's just dumb it down the most that you possibly can because it really is just like so overused and so hard to um, kind of talk about. But speaking on all of that, um, I guess, bigger question, how do you think sustainability can be scalable in business? And can it be scalable in business? You can think about that if you would like, <laughs> or whoever wants to take it. Since you guys do have those, though, yeah, feel free. <laughs> I think it 100% can be scalable in companies who are doing it right. A lot of them are starting to really open up their business so that other people kind of emulate what they're doing. And I think that that's the way that it will really be able to change. The more transparent companies are and really showing people, a smaller company, how they can scale up sustainably, it's completely manageable, completely doable, it needs to happen, and it really, I really think it will be done. I think it can be done, but I think it is one of the hardest problems that we're going to need to solve in business because the current way that the fashion industry, many of these consumer businesses run is a linear process where it's like you take, make, waste it. Whereas moving to a more circular economy, more circular fashion, it, there's some really endemic hard problems to solve. So for example, I used to work at Amazon Fashion. I led our resale and circular fashion business, launched our luxury fashion business, luxury resale fashion business from the ground up. And one of the big challenges at Amazon, of all places, is it is a retailer. It's very much consumption-based of new items, new retail experiences, and from that point of view, it's not sustainable. But it's very scalable, and it's obviously very profitable. So I think the challenge for all of us is to think around how do we help circular fashion, circular systems, be implemented at scale, and I think that's something we're gonna to have to figure out any really smart, creative people, like all of you interested in it, to help solve that. I think also when we started out, we launched with around 10 brands because there really weren't any brands that were meeting our requirements, and we've seen so much over the past year, there'll be so much more demand from consumers, so there have been more brands than we've ever expected to see, and I think that will just continue to keep going. Uh, to Danielle's point, I definitely think the circular economy and secondhand market is something that can help scale sustainable fashion. It doesn't require new resources to create new products. And a lot of times items are perfectly good when a person is done with them in their own closet. And they, even if they need a little bit of love, they could be mended or repaired or totally upcycled and resold. And that is a business opportunity with a fairly low cost for brands. Um, I also think as sustainability evolves in the business world and brands start to look at it as a part of their strategy and not a problem that they have to fix um, or something that they have to meet just because the public expects it, um, that it will become more integrated into business and therefore there will just be more sustainable solutions. Um, if your main material for your product is cotton and the land is unable to grow cotton, that's a business problem. And if you start looking at it that way, these brands will start thinking of more unique ways to recover their old product or recycle it, or use a different material that uses less uh, land, or you know, all of those things. It's just something that brands, once they start thinking about sustainability in a different way, and see it as an opportunity, that it will allow that scale and that growth. Great points. <laughs> um, I will say from the um, designer side, I get this asked this question a lot because people are always asking like, oh, where do you see yourself in five, 10 years or whatever, and I'm three years into my business. So they're always like, oh, are you gonna manufacture? Like, are you gonna scale it? Because I'm still sewing everything myself. Um, it's been a long three years, but <laughs> a fun three years. Um, but obviously everybody's always like, well, you can't do that forever, can you? Like, you need to scale at some point. But then there's always that controversy of like, well, I don't wanna like, be making too much stuff out there. Like I want, I like the idea of making made to order like small batches of things, but also it is unsustainable to my lifestyle to be making it all by myself. So it just really gets very messy with that. Um, so I always think that's a fun question to ask because I think there's just so many gray areas of sustainability. 
and what is scalable and like if that goes into capitalism too much, like feeding into it, just making money too much and then like forgetting about everything that goes under it. Um, so it's just a fun one. And I don't think there's a right answer, so that's the answer. <laughs> um, but speaking of it though, the industry though has a lot of issues clearly. What is the one issue that like you wish you could fix with industry? Like the one thing you wish you could just like take out and just be like, well, the world's a better place now. Um, traceability throughout the supply chain. Um, I have a supply chain background and I think the most shocking thing that I ever learned was most brands don't know where their cotton's coming from. Like they, they, it's literally impossible unless you own a cotton farm and only use cotton from that farm to trace back where the cotton that's used to make your clothes come from because it's picked, it's lock, like lumped into this big market People purchase it from there. It's threaded into a thread. It's woven into a fabric, and then it's sold to a fabric store. Like there's so many steps just for one fabric, one material. And if you think about every single thing that goes into an item of clothing, the thread, the fabric, the finishings, the buttons, the tags, like everything comes from somewhere. And there's almost no traceability throughout the industry. So that makes it really hard to set goals or even track any kind of progress on environmental issues, ethical issues. Um, yeah, traceability is, is a big one. Like we were discussing, there's no explicit definition for the word sustainable. Um, so I would like to see some kind of standard or stamp of approval for sustainability. I. It would save us a lot of time <laughs> for our vetting process. Um, but yeah, when you go to a grocery store, you can see that something's organic because it has that little stamp. Um, there's no regulatory body in the sustainable fashion industry, so would love to see that. It would save us a lot of time. For me, it would be localizing everything. So everyone's outfits right now, the majority of the pieces are probably from different countries, and then it gets shipped all around on boats, airplanes, the emissions, you already know the issue there, yeah. to create a top. And I wish that if you are sourcing your cotton in Australia, you get it manufactured in Australia, you get your buttons there and everything, just to really localize the process. From my point of view, I think if we can make shopping secondhand as easy and fun as shopping new, we can help generations of consumers shop secondhand first. Because the reality is, I think, we all get it, like we're in this. It's hard for us to remember that for the average consumer, they don't know how to shop secondhand, either in real life, at a thrift store, at a consignment store, or online. And I think it's just far too overwhelming for the average person to make more sustainable choices. So I, that's, this is what I like live and breathe and think about all day, of like how do we make thrifting 10 times easier and more accessible because it is more affordable. It's often higher quality. The pieces already exist, but it's just really hard for most people. So I want to change that. And you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that as well. Yeah. Um, no, I would actually like for you to talk more about teleport and just the second hand market. Because obviously it's growing exponentially over the past few years. Um, but I kind of want to hear your perspective kind of being in it because I don't know, I'm not on that side of things. You guys aren't either and more of on the consumer side of things. Um, so I'd really love to hear on the business like side what the second hand market has been like, um, what your experience has been like, Teleport, the community you're growing there, um, and just you know a little more about Teleport. You are one of our sponsors, so shout out Teleport. We're um, going to give you a little bit of time to shy. <laughs> Of course. So Teleport is a video app for thrifting fashion. You can think of it as like TikTok meets Depop. And we're really focused on having to be community driven and in a video first environment because we all know from shopping on Depop or in Poshmark or whatever your favorite resale site app is, it can be really hard to understand from a photo. Is this cute? Is this a look? Or is this like not okay? <laughs> and so video is just easier for both sellers and buyers to see how something Styled, how did they put it together in an outfit? And then being able to shop it, shop it directly in the app. So not like commenting on TikTok, where did you get that, where did you get that, where did you get that? Uh, but being able to do that directly in the app. But zooming out from secondhand fashion, this is 
a hundred billion dollar industry globally. It's huge. So you think around fashion overall and a hundred billion second hand fashion. And it's growing nine times faster than retail fashion. So it's big business. And to your point, brands, businesses are getting hold of that, that younger consumers, Gen Z, millennials, even Gen Alpha, as they come into purchasing power, they want to thrift. They want to find cool, unique, fun pieces and figure out their personal style. But the experiences on existing apps, they pave the way to normalize it. But I think what I'm encouraged with what we're building at Teleport is taking it to the next level of how do we make it so much easier, so much more fun. Because I really believe that fashion should be fun. It should be something that we feel joy in and feel confident in, helps us express our style, helps us meet other people who like the same aesthetics, like the same looks. And I think shopping for fashion online, apologies, coming from Amazon fashion, <laughs> it is not fun. Like it's not fun to shop online for fashion for the vast majority of places. Like you search, you sort, you filter, you add to your cart, you compare, you come back to it. There's all this pressure to buy into fast fashion, the latest micro trend. And I just think there's a better way for fashion. It should not make you feel guilty. It should not make you feel like you're behind on trends or not cool. Like it should be something that makes you feel good. And so I think what we're building at Teleport is very much a community that's like sister to the traveling pants for thrifted clothes. <laughs> so one of our users, one of our community members, Natalia, is in the front row. I thrifted this amazing vintage Charlotte Bruce corset top from her. It fit like just enough, but I <laughs> put it back on teleport and someone just bought it. So it's like we've got this like chain of it staying in a circular system. People are styling it in different ways, they're showing it off in different ways, and being able to tag each other to be like, hey, I'm wearing this from your closet and it's gonna live on. And so really excited that it's gonna be a fun, positive community where you can figure out your style, you can meet other people who share your aesthetics, whatever trend you're interested in, and be able to shop more sustainably way. I love that. We love Teleport. It's a really fun app if you get on it. Scrolling through, I'm like, cute outfits. It's so fun. I was like TikTok, but like only outfits, which is the best, arguably. Um, I also want to zero in on you. Zero in on you. Wow, that was a good, that was a good one. Um, but I was like, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I would love to hear about your betting process a little bit more in depth of what you guys look for. Um, I am a brand on their side, so I passed the process, but I will say it was an intense process. I had a whole interview with Bridget, and she was drilling me. And I was like, I'm the only one making clothes. Like, it's just me. Um, but no, I really would like to hear more about it, because it really is an intense process. And um, yeah, I feel like just the general public doesn't always know what goes behind it, so I'd love to hear more. I'm glad you thought it was intense. It was. <laughs> I love when people say that. I'm like, oh, go ahead. Uh, so basically what we do is we'll just kind of create like a lifeline and a story of how a piece is made. So my questions basically start from like, where is the fabric that you're using? Where's the cotton grown? And then have them walk me through the entire process of how that cotton then turns into a t-shirt and all the hands that touch it along the way. Because we want to make sure part of sustainability, obviously it's not just the environmental side, but also the ethical side and the people that touch it. We want to ensure that every person's accounted for. And obviously you have a much simpler yes. version of your supply chain than most people, which makes it very easy for me. But for the brands that are bigger, we just want to make sure that everything completely checks out. The factories, the workers, the dyes, everything is accounted for. And I think what we found is like a common aspect of a brand that we look for is either the utilization of dead stock fabrics and like regenerative fabrics. That was really important. Um, when we, when we only had like 30 brands that met our requirements, that was like a large portion of the brand that we look for. Love that. Um, and I'm glad I passed the test. <laughs> but I would also like to ask Megan, from the like influencer standpoint, you work with a lot of brands. So you also have to you know, bet them kind of for yourself. 
Um, so what are things that you look out for when brands reach out to you? Like, hey, we'd love to send you a product. Like, obviously you don't say yes to everything that comes your way. Um, but I would love to hear about your personal vetting process on who you want to like, obviously promote to your viewers. Yeah, I think the first thing I look out for as like a red flag is just inconsistencies. There's a lot of brands these days that have a sustainable collection or are coming out with like a swim line that's made with recycled materials. Like, cool, but what about the rest of your swim? Like, why not, if you make some with recycled materials, why not make all of it with recycled materials? Like, you've proven that you can do it and that there's a market for it. Um, so I look for brands that are doing something consistently across all of their product lines, or at the very, very least, say, we're starting with this small collection, and next season we will scale to be fully meeting this sustainable label. Um, I also look for brands that have uh, clear and honest sustainability goals that are updated. Um, like any brand can say, oh, we want to be carbon neutral by 2025. Like, okay, so 2023. <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> You're like, how are you doing that? Um, there are some brands that will set great sounding sustainability goals, but you will You'll never hear an update on them, and while they look great on paper, I want to hear, even if you're not on track to meet the goal, tell me. <laughs> Say that. Say, how are we doing with this? Uh, not so great, but here's what we're going to do to meet this goal or get back on track. Um, really, I look for just that honesty. There is no perfect sustainable brand. There is no perfect sustainable fashion. Um, so looking for brands that are really intentional about the materials that they choose, how much they produce, what kind of products they produce, um, and especially brands that take responsibility for educating their customers um, and their community about how to purchase more consciously, how to take care of their products, and yeah, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, going off of that honesty, we find when we meet with these brands, the founders are so excited to tell us about their sustainability practices, and you can really tell the difference between a brand who, like, will eventually will eventually be on zero versus one that we can't take. But these founders are so excited to take you through the entire supply chain process. We thought about X, Y, Z. The one thing that we lack is packaging. Can you help us find a more sustainable packaging? So you can really just get a vibe from a founder and see if they're actually passionate about what they're doing or if they just want to market themselves as sustainable and reap the benefits from it. I always like looking at the about page on brands' websites because a lot of times a lot of sustainable brands are smaller um, and a lot of them are woman-owned and they have amazing, like really thorough about pages like, this is how I got inspired to make this brand. And the brands that I love supporting are the ones that have founders that did it for sustainability. They were in it to solve a specific issue with sustainability in the fashion industry, and those are the kinds of brands that I want to support. Obviously, not every brand is going to start off as a sustainable brand, and we want brands that were started just to make money and exist as a business to also become more sustainable, but I think you can always tell when a brand's intention is to jump onto the trend of sustainability or try to like meet that market demand of having a green business and the brands that are started really with the goal of offering a more sustainable solution. I also like Natalia's oh. brand. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I would also like to say that if you do have questions, we will be also taking questions. So just think about that for a second. Um, but my last little question is, like, talk about sustainability with people who aren't in the sustainability space is a tough conversation. Um, because I feel like in a way, you almost sound really pretentious when you're talking about it. And you're like, oh, I'm sustainable when I'm shopping. Or like, it just, you know, it doesn't sound attractive to the average person if they don't really know what that really means. It just sounds very off-putting. Um, so what are ways in which you talk to, you know, your maybe even family, friends, close uh, people to you about it when they haven't been exposed to it the way we have? Because I feel like now it's very natural for us to just go, oh, yeah, whatever. But it's not as natural to everybody. Um, so what are ways that you have to have those conversations in a more maybe gentle way or in a way that maybe they would understand more and like kind of get into the same mindset that you're at? I think it depends on the context. I try to inject some nuance in the conversation because something for teleport, a lot of our new community members are younger. They're 
teens, early 20s, and I think it starts from a point of empathy, of knowing, okay, they're younger, they're still figuring out their style, they probably don't have a ton of disposable income yet, so I think expecting them to invest in a more expensive, sustainable brands right at the back can be really off-putting and probably just makes them more defensive. Or what I've often seen in this space, like to be vocally self-critical as like a sustainable fashion community, is like the naming and shaming. And I think that also puts people on the defensive mode. It's like, well, I don't want to shop at Shein, but X, Y, Z reason. And there's a ton of reasons that people give and become very, very defensive. I think some of us in the room who are on social media talking about this can attest to that. Um, but I think it comes down to how do you help bring people along in the conversation? The way I often do it from a secondhand and thrifting perspective is okay, you want to shop this look, this new trend, whatever it is, coastal cowgirl, made up thing. But if you want to shop that look, see what actually inspires you from it. Do you like it, number one? Do you actually like it? Not just like the cute girl you talk, saw on TikTok. Do you actually like the thing? And then from there, how can we find a secondhand piece that fits that aesthetic? Let's go from there. Because it's probably going to be higher quality. It's going to be more durable. It's stood the test of time if it's a vintage item. And I think that can create an aha moment when you can touch and feel and try on something that is so much more valuable and higher quality than a fast fashion piece that's gonna like fall apart in the wash. Because at the end of the day too, it's like, you're getting ripped off when you're buying these fast fashion pieces that <coughs> look cute, but then don't hold up versus something that might be a little bit more expensive, but then you're gonna have and restyle and love in your closet. So this is something that's been very relevant in my life recently because I live with an investment banker who is making for consumer goods companies. So we have a lot of like, she'll be banking on XYZ clothing company, I'll be reading the new IPCC report crying, and then we try to you know meet in the middle there. And what I found helps me is just kind of always assuming positive intent. I'm like, no one's malicious, they just don't know. Your story is a great example of that. When you're living in Indiana, you're not like, I hope the earth is overheating. You just didn't quite know. And now that you know, you're able to make better decisions about it. So I think that's why it's really important to educate people in a way that they want to be educated, not kind of overwhelm people with information, but more so meet them where they're at and expose them to more, because when you know more, you can do more. And going off of that point, um, when from a customer standpoint, from people that visit our website, we first and foremost wanted to create a platform that was fashion forward. We know that um, people still, people assume that sustainable fashion is this like granola, like, <laughs> like not the cutest pieces. And so we wanted to really prioritize that fashion forward mindset. So when creating our website, we wanted to capture every single person coming onto our website and then sneak in some educational aspects so they can read about the entire life cycle of the piece that they're purchasing. We have entire pages about fast fashion and just the fashion industry as a whole. So I think definitely meeting people where they're at and then trying to sneak in all of the educational aspects. Yeah. Um, something that I do in like all of my sustainability education online, but also in person, is just embrace the imperfections and talk about the ways that I'm not perfect because there is no perfect in environmentalism. Like I'm wearing a Zara dress from their like greenwashed joined life <laughs> collection right now. I got it secondhand. It's really cute. I really like it. I'm gonna wear it for a long time. But yeah, there's fast fashion in my closet, and I specifically chose to buy fast fashion <laughs> secondhand. Um, and that's what people need to hear to feel like they can see themselves in a movement. If you only see people wearing really expensive sustainable brands or totally saying, I'm not ever buying new clothing ever again and I'm just wearing what I have now, it's really hard to see yourself being part of that movement if that's not you. I love fashion. I'm going to be a shopper for my whole life. I just want to do it more sustainably. I'm going to shop more second hands. I'm going to you know, find items in more from more sustainable brands or borrow from a friend's closet, things like that. Um, I also think that talking with people and figuring out what really motivates them is important. So if I'm talking to my dad, he doesn't care about fashion. Like, he's a businessman. So I'm going to talk to him about the business 
importance of sustainability. What if cotton is your main raw material and the ground is drying up? What are you gonna do? That's something you have to care about in business. Um, people care about human health, talking about the impacts of some dyes on human health. If it gets into the rivers, as it does in places like India, how does that impact the human population? Maybe they don't care about fast fashion, but there are tons of issues that connect to, I mean, sustainability connects with everything. So finding a way to connect with what people really care about and what gets them going and kind of getting sustainability issues in there is really helpful in terms of having positive conversations. Yes, and kind of going off of that, um, I learned a lot from you, I will say. I did follow Megan a lot, like longer before she ever knew who I was. Um, but something that she's really good at is talking about cost per wear too. Something that I'm pretty sure I learned from you, I really don't know. But that's something that now I talk to a lot of people about um, when they're like, well this is like on sale, like I love this, whatever, but I'm like, are you gonna wear it multiple times? Is this like a, you're gonna wear it once, you're not gonna like it, you're not gonna wear it again, like is it really worth it? Like is the $20 really worth it at that point? Um, because everybody cares about their finances. Like that is the one thing you can always talk about that everybody will be like, yeah, you're right, I should not spend my money. Um, so I always like to take it from that standpoint or like on the other end of things, if you are buying into sustainable piece, which is gonna be more expensive, usually well into the hundreds. Um, it sounds very like scary to be like, oh, I'm about to drop like, I don't know, $100, $200 on a single piece of clothing. Like I, laugh, maybe two years ago, spent like, hundred-ish dollars on a pair of jeans, and it was the most expensive pair of jeans I've ever bought, and it, it hurt a little. I was like, I'm dropping it. But I've worn those jeans every single day since, I think, and they're my baggy jeans, and if you know, you know. I literally wear them every other day. Like, I do not wear another pair of jeans. So I'm like, cost per wear is probably less than a cent at this point. Uh, so just having that mindset of just like, well, in the long run, it's gonna last me so much longer, so it's, you know, fine. Uh, but even fast fashion pieces, I have pieces from middle school that I still wear, because I also haven't grown, so that's also a plus. Um, it just kind of stuck where I was 13, but, um, but I have this really cute little sport that I wear all the time that I literally got at Forever 21 on Black Friday in middle school, and it still is great to this day. Um, so you can still take care of like fast fashion pieces. And that's always something I tell people because um, whenever I post, obviously on TikTok, and I mention sustainable fashion, mention that I'm a sustainable brand, I will always get that one comment that's like, well, I can only afford fast fashion. And I'm like, most people can only afford fast fashion. Like, me too. Uh, but I'm like, that's not a bad thing. Like, it's okay to, you know, if you buy a pair of jeans from Zara, but they're the pair of jeans that fit you perfectly that you're gonna wear forever. Cause like, when you find a good pair of jeans that fit you right, like, you're gonna wear those every single day of your life. Um, so like, that's sustainable in itself too. It's just um, kind of that mindset sh mindset shift um, that I always like to point out because I think it is really intimidating to just go into like, okay, well, I'm gonna stop buying fast fashion, now what? Because, you know, the secondhand market is intimidating when you don't know how to, like, properly search because going into thrift stores is a really, you know, very difficult process, I would say, for most. You have to have a lot of patience for that, and some people have it and some people don't. Um, and then online apps, like you said, are can be difficult, but teleport's really easy. I'm just gonna put that out there. <laughs> uh, videos are a lot easier than pictures, that is facts. Um, but yeah, it is intimidating, so mindset shift. Um, but I do want to open it up if anybody has any questions, literally anything, it could be specific to teleport, um, in the app, thrifting, whatever, shop zero, sustainability as a content creator, um, or as a designer. We've got a lot of perspectives here, so you can really ask away. Um, yes? So you guys are talking about like, the defensiveness coming from the consumer side. Um, I face this a lot, literally, all the time, because I'm in the space of inclusive fashion, so there's so much resistance all the time. And I'm curious as to what type of defensiveness you guys get from the business-facing side, like from the brands that are like, no, I am sustainable. You know, like, how do you kind of approach it with, like, no, like, we believe that you're trying the best, but, like, kind of how you navigate those situations as to, like, how they could genuinely be doing better while not stepping on their toes, I guess. So we actually haven't gotten any pushback from brands who haven't met our requirements yet. So I will keep you updated because I'm sure at some point there will be. But for the ones that don't meet our requirements, 
will explain to them exactly why they don't meet our requirements, and if they need help changing those specific things, we can consult them about becoming more sustainable. Um, but yeah, haven't experienced that issue thus far, but I will let you know. <laughs> That's good though. <laughs> So to add on that, clearly the reason everyone is having a sustainable fashion brand, it's a problem way bigger than all of us, the climate emergency going on. So I think that's part of it too, where a lot of people aren't super resistant. They more so want to learn what they can do better because if they genuinely you know, care about the issue, they understand it's more than like a little ego push about their brand not quite being there yet. I think from <laughs> like influencer side also, um, yeah, brands want to do good, um, and a lot of times, most of the time, when brands are doing more sustainable things, even if it's not perfect, they're doing it with the right intentions. It's very easy to tell if a brand doesn't have the right intentions, they'll either lie about something or be really shady about, oh, we can't give you information about that. So, being really clear in your response and saying like, hey, you said this, but you know, I think this could be more sustainable, or like, this is what I really look for in sustainable brands. Is there something you can tell me more about what you do or what your goals are? That's a really good way to approach those kind of conversations to try to encourage them to think more deeply about their sustainability practices, practices instead of them being like, oh, well, like, we're not perfect. Like, how, how do you expect us to do all of that? So leading with a kind of educational, like this is what I'm looking for. What can you tell me about that? I think has been helpful. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Um, I have a two part. First part's kind of adding to the conversation. No one asked for my opinion, but <laughs> um, I really like what you said about you know talking about sustainability, not just in the fashion sector of things, because it affects everyone. Obviously, we're all living on our only planet, and we take care of it. But I think that it's a really important thing to talk about for sustainability and how big it is in the sustainable sector of like life because we're talking about you know fast fashion and how it affects us and affects our fashion industry but there are parts of the world that don't give a rats <laughs> about fast fashion because they might not have access to it in the first place so I think a big part of sustainability is also talking about how sustainability then affects other industries or affects um you know other parts of our world. So anyway, I'd like that you mention that. For my second question, um, I'm a big thrifter and I'm also a sustainable culture creator and I get a lot of um, hate, I guess, about thrifting and how if you buy thrifted clothes and you resell it or you're doing this and we're the people that are ruining thrifting because, you know, prices are so high now and we're, we're making it a trend or whatever like that. And so what are your guys' opinions on that, I guess? And how do you think that we kind of can combat this? In my personal opinion, I think that thrifting is great and that we should make it more possible that we should only be, we should only be buying from the outfit or buying from the same I will be passing this to Danielle because it's obviously her thing. Um, but I will say, I, I just think it's so dumb, first of all, that people get mad about that. But they do, because I see it very often on a lot of creators' um, videos. It's always like, the people making thrift prices go up. I'm like, no, the stores are choosing to do that. They didn't say like, Lexi came yeah. over here and we're gonna bring it up. Like that's not how it works. Um, but I think the one thing that I always think about is just like the amount of clothes that don't even get sold. Like if you take your stuff to Goodwill, like there's, you know, nothing, not that much gets sold at Goodwill. Like they get donations every single day. I think about how much you've personally probably given to Goodwill in your lifetime and think about how many like hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people probably give to them and like that's a lot of stuff that's not going to get sold um, and then even it goes down to the goodwill bins and like it's like dollar bins and that doesn't even get all sold and then after that it just gets shipped off to africa and then they just burn it there or it just sits there and it just ruins their lives um so you are not the problem but i will be passing this to daniel because i'm sure you've gotten a lot of that <laughs> thoughts on this because the the latest argument and this comes up every year, maybe two years, there's some viral moment that this conversation comes up. Basically, sums to like resellers on Depop or wherever else, they're like the landlords of our generation. Which is the most <laughs> unhinged argument. When you've been in that space, or you've worked in sustainable fashion, or in resale in some way. Because looking at the facts, 
So to Natalia's point, when you donate something to a Goodwill, to a Salvation Army, whatever thrift store, 80% of that stuff does not get sold. 20% of it hopefully gets sold, but eight out of 10 things will not be sold. Of those things, 85% of clothes eventually will end up in landfill. They'll be exported to the global south. They will pollute waterways and land. We have so many clothes out there that the idea that somehow that small time reseller, so people who spend their time digging through the racks, digging through the goodwill bins, are like jacking up prices is just fundamentally not true. I think what happens in like the chronically online spaces is particularly on TikTok, where there are thrift hauls that has become very popular. I think people see that curation and they don't see anything behind the scenes of someone being at the Goodwill bins for four hours every single day and picking out the really cool vintage gems and basically like hunting and gathering in the modern age. <laughs> but they don't see any of that. They just see the curation and the cool picks and how they're styled. But the reality is that most of those clothes are gonna end up in landfill and no one is picking them. It happens for upcycle pieces as people rework vintage, create more modern ways of like, oh, you're ruining it for the rest of us. But again, most clothes, unfortunately, will end up in landfill. So anyone who is spending their time, who has the patience, has the skill, has like the eye to see those good pieces, that is something I think we should all try to do more. Because if we can, even like thrift Zara, secondhand, like that is preventing more stuff from going to landfill. So I have a lot of thoughts on this, but <laughs> the like landlords, deep pop reseller, <laughs> is like truly <laughs> unhinged. <laughs> Being like, well, I don't know, but I know that I got it 
that talk. I know I got it secondhand. I know I got it from that. Is hopefully good enough of a thing. Um, but I think the the question is more of when like you're buying cotton new. Um, I think it's really about just like buying from brands that have that transparency too. Um, a lot of them will specify what kind of cotton because the cotton grows obviously in a bunch of different places and like the quality is you know different in different uh, areas of the world that it also grows on. So sometimes they are very vocal about like oh we got it here or whatever. Um, but I would love to hear more about like brands that do actually have that um, and how they kind of go around that. So it's definitely difficult because kind of what you just heard from the story over there, if you are gonna do something that's more focused on like waist-led design, so you're getting your dead stock fabric, you're upcycling it, then you lose the power to kind of see where the fabric came from, but then you know that at least you're contributing to giving the fabric a better life than if it were to be incinerated or just like thrown away. So that's my take on that. On the flip side, there's also kind of a movement going on where people are more focused on regeneration and making sure that the cotton and everything that they're growing is done in a way that preserves the land. And so what I've found is that a lot of brands that we work with who are more so focused on a regeneration approach, they do so in a way where they're able to get this transparency from the people who are making the fabric, dyeing it, and if someone invests that much time and infrastructure into regenerative agriculture or something like that, then it's definitely gonna come as well with dyes that are understood from a similar environmental footprint. So I think a lot of it is just having these conversations and you definitely will get to a place where you'll be like, why can no one tell me what my fabric's made out of? And that's the issue. So hopefully though, in the future, a lot of fabrics are made in a way that's better. There's a lot of companies that are starting to do that right now. We will do one more question. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so the truth. Okay, go for Lauren. Okay. This might be messy coming out, so oh, I'll no. take it away. <laughs> but I feel like there's there's like a spectrum of fashion where there's artistic self-expression, and you're like this, and that's like from the beginning of time, right? The only culture is expressing themselves with what they're wearing, jewelry, and, and all the celebration of that. But then there's also like Danielle, what you mentioned of trends and wanting to fit in, and being like I am a reflection of my era of our generation at the same time. And then there's like another axis, I guess, of like sustainability as in, like Meg, what you were saying about only owning a few pieces and taking really good care of them and then being like, um, not quite like capsule wardrobe but like owning very few things and being very connected to them. And then the other end of like, I live in like abundance and I wanna have like expression in all the things all the time. So I guess my question to you is how, within your communities or within like online or in person or customers or whoever, what's the invitation or what's the like communication around, yes, like be expressive, but also like don't fall, how do you like encourage folks, don't fall for the trend, it's very tempting, and business is doing everything they can to like lure you in, but use fashion as a tool of self-expression. Yes, that's yes. A, Sorry. no, that's a great question because I think there is always I think I personally, as a designer, have that issue a lot because I love to create. Like, that is literally what I do for a living and I'm very passionate about it. It's just, like, what I love to do. But then I'm, like, I am literally creating more and more pieces that the earth does not need. Like, we do not need more pieces, but I'm, like, that is my form of self-expression, like, my artistic expression in quite literally my entire life at this point. Um, so I'm, like, I'm not going to stop that. And I think something that I've learned is, like, you can't sacrifice joy for sustainability. Um, and so I think it leads back to that imperfect environmentalism that you talk about so often because like there is no perfect sustainability and I think that we can't just like not give ourselves those like joyous things that we love so much that make our life so like filling um, for the sake of being like well this is wasteful um, because you can get in a really really negative mindset if you're constantly like well I can't go get take out sushi because it's going to come in plastic or like you know, putting it into that perspective of just like getting in this little like shell, like oh, I don't want to do anything because like, it will be too imperfect because it's just like not, just not legit. Um, it's just not a way to live and not a good way to like live a full, full life. Um, so on the artistic expression side of things, I think like it's important to just create. I think it's even fun to, in the sustainability space to create because sometimes you are quote unquote limited. Um, it's like, okay, well let's see how I can like upcycle this. 
Um, let me see what I can do with like the few materials I have. Like the entire collection that I made was just out of stuff that I literally had sitting in my fabric closet. Some of the fabrics have been there for probably three years, just sitting there for me, waiting to do something. I never did. Um, so I really challenged myself to do that, and I think sometimes that challenge also builds that artistic expression and like allows that creativity to unfold, which I think is the fun side. And then also more on the consumer end, I think personal style is such a big part of just fashion in general, but sustainable fashion. It's something I've also been learning more over the past few years, because I just think, you know, as you grow up, you kind of learn more about yourself and what you actually like to wear versus what's just trendy. Because um, I think coming out of like high school, you just wear whatever everybody's wearing, and then you kind of leave and you're like, wait, I actually prefer wearing this, or like you move to different places and you're like, oh, like I like what this is, and um, you know, you have that period of time where you're more experimental and like you're trying different things, um, just learning about yourself and what you really like to wear and what really fits you and your personality, I think is so important to then also curate a closet of clothes that you really love to wear. Um, and it all kind of just comes down, but I feel like even outside sustainability, like that's just how people should live. Like you should buy clothes that you love so, so much and that you want to wear over and over again. That fit you like so, so perfectly. You're like, I want to wear these jeans every single day of my life, like I do. Um, so yeah, I lost my train of thought kind of. But anyway, personal style, you should get into that. Um, but I feel like you could probably speak on that quite a bit as well, so. <laughs> yeah, something I definitely try to talk about or bring into my content the way that I talk about sustainable fashion is the importance of style. Like fashion is an industry, like its goal is to sell you things and they want to sell you new things and always make you feel like there's something that you are going to miss out on if you don't buy it right now and it's really hard, especially if people of our generation, we've grown up with this industry feeding us new stuff all the time, um, so it's hard to like decouple your mindset from the industry. Do I really like that? Or did I just see like 15 people wearing it on the street today? Would it actually work in my closet? Or is it just fun to look at? Um, and I also like to talk about how trends are cyclical. It's like there are people whose jobs are literally trend forecasters. And they'll be like, hmm, in like four years, neon's gonna be big again. <laughs> and like, we, we went through neon, we did that a few years ago, like a lot, lot of years ago. Um, if that stuff exists on the second hand market, you can find it vintage, it's gonna be really high quality compared to the stuff that the fast fashion industry is gonna be pushing out. So looking at today's trends and looking at them as something that you can get inspired by and not necessarily something you have to buy into to be fashionable or to be part of the trend, um, and instead look at it as something you can interpret and maybe pull things from your own closet that kind of fit with the way people are, things are being styled instead of needing to go out and buy something to just fit. Um, it's a way more authentic way of participating in the fashion industry and um, that's, that's what it's all about. It's about your, your personal style. Um, not to say that buying into trends is bad, but there are other ways to do it more sustainably and like really buying into trends that you know you're going to keep wearing after it's not cool <laughs> to wear it because you just love it. Um, and yeah, second hand, like trends will be back. Bridget and I always like to say that we're at zero, we're the only shopping platform that doesn't actually want our customers to shop from us. Um, and so that, with that point being said, we know that we're never going to be in a world where people don't consume. So at the end of the day, we just want to make sure that all the pieces on our website are extensively vetted so that our customers know. They trust us. They can go on our website and purchase something and know that all of the work has already been done for them. So we understand that we're going to have customers who are going to buy one piece and keep them for the rest of their life. We're gonna have other customers that purchase something from our website and you sell it or upcycle it. So just keeping that in mind throughout growing is really important. I actually think microtrends can serve a purpose and it's for people who are still figuring out the personal style. I think the end goal is when you have really cultivated, experimented with your style, you have a really good sense of what you like, what you don't like, what fits and flatters your body. Especially when you're younger, you don't really know that. And so you might succumb to whatever fast fashion, micro trend you're seeing. And I think that's part
part of just like growing up and figuring out your style. So I, I start with empathy for that, like we've all gone through it, and maybe some of us are still the same size as middle school. I'm not the A lot of the times they are cyclical. So I think for what we're building on Teleport is, yes, you can participate in trends and micro trends, but the goal is with the purpose of figuring out what your style is so that you feel really confident and joyful and you have a more sustainable choice. Because the reality is that whatever new manufacturer trend brands are pushing out, the industry is pushing out, I guarantee you can find it thrifted secondhand. It might take a little bit more time or research and education to know like what do you search for? What are these things actually called? What is that style or silhouette? And that's also I think a fun part of fashion is you get to learn about what these things are. Because there are people, there are designers who are creating things who come from a history and like training and they're like real experts in their craft. And when you love fashion, not just to try to fit in, but to really show your style, that's where I think there's like deeper joy and that's more sustainable because you're not just gonna be chasing and consuming and chasing and consuming. So my theory is like micro trends used to be like the Zara's of the world. Then they became the Sheen's of the world. And now it's like every day there's a micro trend popping up on TikTok or wherever. I think it'll just implode at some point. Where it's like, how much faster can it go? Like more than a day, more than every 10 minutes. Like at some point it will just implode and what's gonna be left is the people who have cultivated their personal style and the people who have not. And so I advocate for, don't just like chase whatever trend is out there. Really use that to examine what you like, what you don't like, and then build that personal song. Because that's the best hedge for over-consuming. I think that's a great note to end up on. That was a perfect, perfect little wrap-up. Um, I know there were more questions, but at the end of the full show, obviously all the ladies here will be out and about. You can come up and ask them questions personally as well. They are all incredible at what they do. Um, and I'm so blessed to just know them and have them in my community. Um, speaking of, we're going to go into the show now. We're going to do a little reset up of the chairs for the show, but um, so feel free to like, you know, get a little drink in the meantime. Um, but also, I want to talk about the designers that are going to be showing with me for a little bit. I feel like I'm just so like blessed to have a very good community of people around me, um, and I feel, feel like I've come to a great just like community of, like designers and um, just people in the industry that love what I love too. Um, and just like want to support each other because I think the first thing a lot of people say to me when I'm like, oh, I'm gonna host a show with four other designers, they're like, aren't they your competition? Like, shouldn't you not be promoting other designers if you wanna like try to promote yourself? Um, but something that I, I strongly, strongly believe in, which maybe, you know, is contradicting in the business world is that I prefer community over competition. Um, very, very strongly believe in that. And sometimes, you know, that gets me in sticky situations but I will still hold on that truth. Um, and all the designers here that are with me are very much on board with that, and I'm so grateful to have them. So you're gonna see that I don't even think they can be considered competition because we're so incredibly different in our styles, uh, which is really fun. We have a great range of designers. Um, my friend Noemi came from London for this, uh, which actually, funny story, <laughs> This whole show came about just because she's here. She, we, ha we were FaceTiming like a month ago, and she was like, what if I just came to LA? And I was like, well, if you do, maybe we should host a show. <laughs> and then like three days later, she booked her flight and I booked the venue, and I was like, I guess we're doing it. Um, so that's how this came to be, fun fact. <laughs> um, but then of course, I called up my friend Veronica, who's in Miami, and I was like, hey, you have to come for this. I can't do this without you. She's one of my first internet friends. Um, and I did New York Fashion Week with her in September and I love her so much. She literally got in today at like 3 p.m. Um, so she barely made it, but she made it. I'm very happy she's here. Um, Susanna is an internet friend that I met literally on Friday, but we've been mutuals for a hot minute. So it's always fun to just like actually meet somebody you've talked to so many times through DMs, obviously. And Brandy is also an inter friend, internet friend I've had who I have actually met already previously when I was just like visiting LA before I moved here. Um, and she's so, so wonderful, and they're all so, so talented. I'm so excited to see all their collections. I, they're so good. Um, so we're going to transition into that, so feel free to get up, get a little drink, and we're gonna reset up and then get into that. <laughs>